stay with us for South Today from the new Mary Rose Museum in Portsmouth. We'll be finding out about the story behind this picture on the day the Mary Rose sank and more about what life was like on board this Tudor warship. It's nearly 500 years since Henry VIII's flagship, the Mary Rose, sank during a battle in the Solent. Now, 30 years after it was raised from the seabed, it has a new home in a purpose-built £35 million museum. With the help of a reconstruction, visitors will get a snapshot of Tudor life at sea. Robert Hall is in Portsmouth, where the official opening of the museum is about to start. Robert. George, you join us live here in the historic dockyard, moments away from this very important ceremony for the port and for the city. How appropriate it should be taking place here, just a few yards from the site where the Mary Rose was built and launched. Now, the journey that's brought her here has taken a very long time. It's involved hundreds of people, painstaking work stretching back over decades and a great deal of money. But this has all been about remembering the crew of the Mary Rose and drawing this generation into their lives, teaching us more about them through the technology now available to us. And perhaps, as was the case on that moment back in the 80s when she was raised from the seabed, this is a moment for the team and their supporters to savour the moment. There is the wreck of the Mary Rose. It has come to the surface. The 11th of October, 1982, the day the Mary Rose came home. Uh, a wonderful moment. You hear all the... Henry VIII had watched his flagship founder during a battle with the French. Only 25 of her 400 strong crew survived. This month, after decades of round-the-clock treatment, the sprays of water and preservative were turned off and the Mary Rose was ready for a new chapter in her story. This is a momentous occasion for the Mary Rose. We've been spraying for over 30 years. Um, so many people involved in the project have contributed over the years um, and it's a really exciting thing to see. In the decades since the Mary Rose was raised from the seabed, she's remained alongside HMS Victory, sealed in a plastic tent and sprayed with water and preservative chemicals. The challenge facing the architects was how to build this 21st century museum around the Mary Rose whilst maintaining that environment and protecting the ancient dock which has become her home. A home which places the recovered starboard side of the hull alongside a reconstruction of the port side, packed with the cannon, cargo and possessions which offer a perfect snapshot of Tudor life. I'm staggered. Never have so many wonderful Tudor things ever been brought together before. You come in and it's ju I just feel that I'm like Carter at the tomb of Tutankhamun. At Southsea Castle, overlooking the wreck site, Archers saluted the crew members who drew the great longbows recovered from the seabed. Advances in technology mean we can now meet one of those men face to face. I think it will astonish people who aren't perhaps aware of how much that great ship yielded up. Once this was a dead ship, an incomplete jigsaw, but no more. The Mary Rose has been reborn. George, this is a great detective story leading from this, the cannon that identified the ship, to all of these thousands of objects. These, for example, tell us a lot about the surgeon. These items here tell us about the master gunner. They lead us to the people, and of course they found remains of some of those people as well. So at last we've got faces, you saw one in that report, and one other set of remains I need to show you, because they have to be the star of the show. Welcome to the ship's dog. <laughs> Tonight, a special South Today to mark the opening of the new Mary Rose Museum. It's almost five centuries since the jewel of Henry VIII's fleet was lost to the Solent. Recovered from the seabed in a daring operation, the wreck has been shrouded ever since behind a preserving spray of water and liquid wax. But tonight, we get the clearest glimpse yet of a unique window on the Tudor world. And here we are live at the historic dockyard as the Royal Marines Band Portsmouth entertain the hundreds of special guests for the opening of the new Mary Rose Museum. 
Hello, I'm Sally Taylor and a warm welcome to a special South today. Just a few metres from here was where the Mary Rose was built and launched. Now, 500 years later, we come to a very significant moment because the ship's bell is now being brought in to the museum here for sailors from HMS Duncan, which is, of course, the newest of the Type 45 destroyers, carrying the bell to the final position, its resting place here, under the roof, reunited with the Mary Rose once again. This morning, this bell was rung over the wreck site in the Solent. It's a bronze bell, Flemish inscri inscription, which just simply reads, I was made in 1510. And as they get into position, it will come in here and it will hang from here. The man watching it, Rear Admiral John Lippier, who's the chief executive of the Mary Rose Trust, this must be a very emotional moment for you because this is the final artifact to be put in place before it opens to the public tomorrow. It is, and I'm very glad to get it back here safely. Had we lost that at sea this morning, I'd be in trouble. However, it is here, it's highly symbolic. That would have been rung just as we went to action stations to, went before sinking. Here it is, coming back in, before we open to the visitors. We rang it at the wreck site today. And we've got Sue Bickerton, who's a conservator, and Dennis Cook, who's uh, one of the exhibition team, just putting it in place. I mean, what have you achieved here that you couldn't have done at the other museum? We have produced thousands of items never seen before. We've ha had been able to bring them through conservation, put them on display. Most of the things here now have never been seen before. So it's exciting. We're putting them back into context. People will walk through into 16th century and see life and death of that time. This whole project, I mean, what would you say has been the most difficult challenge for you? I think, quite honestly, raising the money. Um, that's <laughs> my challenge. But for the conservators, getting the right environment to put these things in, the work of conservation is extraordinary. These things are very fragile, not the bell, but some of the other things. So getting in there is high-tech business to get those environments right. But when people see it, they won't know that. Can I just talk about the money? I mean, I know this is a celebratory day, but I think I should just ask you, £27 million just for the museum here, it's a difficult time economically. Some people say, mm, is this the right amount of money to spend on this type of project? What would you say to that? I'd say it's a huge investment to the town, the city, the south of England, to the country. It is an international destination now. It's hitting the headlines worldwide. It will bring people here. It will earn millions and millions of pounds. And you, this really isn't the end of the Mary Rose story, is it? No. I mean, what is next? Uh, the next chapter, and there are lots of chapters, is to finish conservation, take down the walls so people see it through thin air, then we will build gangways around the outside so people, people walking on the dock bottom, back to the wreck site, we will bring up more in the future. It's very exciting. There it is. The, ship is in, the, the ship's bell is in place now, under the same roof of the Mary Rose, and that is really a very, very significant moment for everybody, the whole team here who have put this together, and those, of course, who dived on the wreck so, so many years ago. Well, this is just one of the artefacts here, and she's going to be resting, as we've said, under the same roof as the Mary Rose, as the ship itself. And a little earlier, I've been taking a look around inside this extraordinary museum. This is an exciting view of the Mary Rose that we haven't seen before. She's always been shrouded in a mist, but now those grey ducks are pumping out hot air to dry her over the next few years. It's when you walk around the museum do you get that Mary Rose experience of what it might have been like to be on this Tudor warship. 415 crew were on board when she went down. Around about only 35 of them survived. But what we have here is a substantial number of the 19,000 artefacts that have been brought up from the seabed.
This is one of the cannons on board the Mary Rose. She was one of the biggest and most heavily armed of the ships in Henry VIII's fleet. And if you look down here on the gun deck, you see this etching on the glass. Well, it represents the anti-boarding netting. This would have prevented the French from coming on board, but sadly, it also trapped the men as the Mary Rose sank. Now, a little later, we'll find out more about what life was like on board this ship. On the day the Mary Rose sank, Henry VIII's England was in turmoil. It was a national crisis as bad as the Spanish Armada. This sweeping image behind me here captures that moment in time. It's the Cowdery engraving, and it's one of the first things you'll see when you come to the museum. But what is the story behind it? Chrissy Sturt has been finding out. The reason historians know as much as they do about the fateful day that the Mary Rose sank is because of the existence of this picture. It was commissioned by Sir Anthony Brown, an important and wealthy Tudor nobleman in the inner circle of Henry VIII. Sir Anthony had it painted onto the wall of his dining room so he could dramatically retell his exploits on the battlefield. Sir Anthony's grand house at Cowdray in West Sussex later burnt down and the painting was lost in the devastating fire. Fortunately, it had previously been copied in minute detail and that engraving survives today. It's been studied by Portsmouth geographer Dominic Fontana, who believes it's a highly accurate depiction of the battle. A lot of people think of the Mary Rose as sailing out on a nice summer's day to a fleet review. Not a bit of it. This was a moment of absolute national terror. The, the French had sent a very large invasion fleet across with a, a large army, outnumbered the English three to one. And the English really had a, a serious problem on that day. If they allowed the French to land, they would have lost. The odds were stacked against us, but the geography of the Solent means that the, as long as the English fleet weren't drawn out into the English Channel to try and take the, the French on out in open water, the French couldn't get into Portsmouth Harbour. They couldn't get in to land their troops. Henry VIII came here to South Sea Castle to watch the battle with his own eyes. He would have witnessed as his state-of-the-art ship, the Mary Rose, loaded with armaments, expensive cannon and nearly 500 men, suddenly keeled over and sank within a matter of seconds. What we also know from the Cowdery engraving is that on the Isle of Wight, there was more bad news. French soldiers had successfully landed. So the French have invaded and they're chasing our troops down this road. That's right, the French are coming down here across the bridge. The English have built a small fort on the other side. They've cut the end of the bridge so that the French can't cross into the main part of the island. And it's that bridge which is key. That bridge stops the French getting any further. Absolutely. So they were constrained to this part of the island. And then four centuries later, we've got this pillbox built here because we're very aware of the fact that the Germans could do exactly the same. It's here for exactly the same purpose, to stop an invader getting too far into the island. It defends this point. The map has already told us so much and we know such a lot because it's so accurate. What other secrets does it still have to give up? Ah, well, over here we've got uh, a galley that's shown with its bow down in the water being sunk. It would be fantastic if we had further information about uh, one of the opponents of the Mary Rose. The chances are there's still something there. Thank you very much. Now you come here and we're back here in the new Mary Rose Museum. And this is uh, so many of the artefacts that we've been talking about 
This is just a few of them. This is all about defending the ship. We've got the pikes there, we've got swords, we've got daggers. These are some of the blocks, of course, which was part of the rigging of the Mary Rose. And so it goes on. Well, there's one man here who knows this period in history better than perhaps many, many other people, and that's Dr. David Stargy, historian. Thank you so much for being here with us. I know that you have um, been quoted as saying the Mary Rose is the English Pompeii preserved by water rather than fire. It's like stepping into a Holbein painting. Well, we're in a Holbein. <laughs> it is the most extraordinary museum. It seems to me it's as though you take the tomb of Tutankhamun, Herculaneum, Pompeii, and you put them all together. And here we are. We're surrounded by everything on board a ship of that 16th of July, 1545. All life, all death, everything here. And what does it tell us? I mean, is it tells us more about Tudor life, doesn't it? What we're discovering with the Mary Rose. Yes, but I, you know, you're being too rational. <laughs> emote, respond. I mean, look at this. That is a pulley. You will find that on your bike nowadays. That is the tackle that will be on a very typical yacht nowadays. That is a ship's chain. It looks just like a ship's chain. They are real. They were us. And too much history is about argument. To begin with, you have to feel you've got to recognize their common humanity. And this museum, I'm going to just say, it does it better than anywhere else, anywhere. And that's very interesting what you say, because I, I've been you know, walking around here for a few days now, having a look at all these spectacular artifacts. I and have spectacular heard, people. Yeah, you can uh, even yes. see the people. Yeah, but I've heard people say, who are walking around having a look, saying, that cannot be real. Right. And I think you do have to pinch yourself Everything. to say, 500 years old. Everything is real. You were talking about weapons. We've got on another floor, we've actually got the bows, the bow staves, these wonderful pieces of you. You look at them, it's as though the carpenter had just finished with the act shaping them. You can see the grain, the colour of the wood. There's a little velvet cap, a coif, and you know, you can still feel the pile of the velvet. How did it, I mean, what did it mean at that time to a nation to lose the Mary Rose, and indeed to Henry VIII? Do you know, I don't think he greatly cared. The poor woman who was the wife of the captain and the vice admiral, Lady Carew, was standing next to him. And he said, more or less, there, 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 dear. These things happen in war. I'll find you another husband. I mean, nowadays, it would be an absolute catastrophe because we've got about three ships. Then he got a decent fleet, and he took the view, you know, War, win some, lose some. And he was winning the war, so you lost a ship. And very briefly, I mean, how do you think she sank? How do you think? <coughs> My guess is probably that the boatswain was drunk <laughs> and forgot, <laughs> forgot to close the, the, the actual um, the gun ports. Uh, and you know, you tack sharply. Remember, she's fighting something the English were not used to galleys, rowboats, which are the equivalent of fast, unpredictable boats. What do you do? You make a sudden manoeuvre and then plop. That's it. Dr. David Starkey, thank you so much. It's Pleasure. fascinating to talk to you, and thank you very much for being with thank us. You. Well, I've been having a bit more of a look around inside this incredible museum at some of the, well, artifacts that tell the stories of what life was like on board for the crew. Imagine being the cook on board the Mary Rose in the bowels of the ship with a cauldron full of bubbling broth. And this is the second cauldron, which was found under a pile of rubble on the seabed. Everything you see here, including the bricks, are original. In fact, everything in the museum is real, and sometimes that's hard to believe. She was probably carrying supplies for two weeks when she sank. This trough here, possibly for making bread, a tankard for a gallon of beer, wooden plates for the crew members, and each one would make their mark so they could identify their own bowl. And if you fancy it, become an archer and try out one of these longbows. You've got to be strong. These are some of the smallest artefacts, dice, which give us an insight into how the crew would have spent their leisure time.
And then there are these boxwood rosaries. Given the religious upheaval during Henry VIII's reign, it just shows that some of the crew were still following the Catholic Church. And here are some of the longbows in the original box in which they were found. And if it wasn't for one man's dogged determination, we wouldn't be standing here talking about this. In the 1960s, Alexander McKee, an author and historian from Hailing Island, made it his mission to find the Mary Rose. Roger Finn takes up the story. In this loft on Hailing Island are the scrapbooks and research notes of Alexander, or Sandy, McKee. They detail every step on the way to finding Henry VIII's flagship, the Mary Rose. Well, well, the most important known wreck in Northwest Europe is here, here, somewhere here. And I'm going to spend my time on that, and even if I fail, I won't actually have wasted the time, because it was a well worthwhile objective. McKee's interest in the ship started as a child. Well, I think the story goes that when he was a ch young child in the, on the Isle of Wight, he had found out about the Mary Rose and had sort of imagined himself finding it and, and bringing it up. So I think maybe that's how it started. In 1965, he approached the South Sea branch of the British Subaqua Club. For five years, they studied the seabed. It was a family affair. Sandy's children would help with logging how long the divers stayed underwater. This rare film was made possible because McKee wrote to Warner Brothers in America, explained what he was doing and asked for a camera. As a result, we have unique footage of the first artefacts raised from the Mary Rose. And then we would go out with the divers and uh, they would, uh, we would then have some soup for them ready when they came out. The trouble was at that time, the sewage was, at the exit of the sewage was there. And each diver, when they came up, absolutely stank. It, it was absolutely, everybody ran, you know. The team was known as Mad Max Marauders. In 1970, they found a Tudor cannon. This proved beyond doubt that the Mary Rose was there. Soon after, archaeologist Margaret Rule joined the project, and the tone of amateur enthusiasm changed. It became much more official. Instead of that feeling of relaxation and, shall I come with you, Dad? Um, and, yeah, that's fine. Um, when I asked, he said, no, you can't because there's too many people involved and it's all official and, you know, numbers are being counted and everybody's got a job and, you know, there's not a job for you there, whereas there was with the divers. As the project grew, McKee's role reduced. And when the Mary Rose was finally raised in 1982, Alexander McKee was not involved. Eventually, we were invited to come on to talk more. And he just, poor chap, stood there and was completely ignored. And he had tears in his eyes. Because without his dream in his head, all those years back on the Isle of Wight, without that dream, no, the Mary Rose wouldn't be there. The Mary Rose wouldn't be sitting there. Alexander McKee was awarded an OBE for his work in rediscovering the Mary Rose. He died in 1992 aged 72. 1973, he dreamt of a museum like this, and here it is 40 years later. This is the crow's nest, the mast top. Great view from here to see the weather, which is timely because Alexis is with us tonight. And what was the weather like, Alexis, on the day that the Mary Rose went down? Well, Sally, the 19th of July was a Thursday, very like today. During the morning and the early afternoon, the winds were really light. The English fleet were motionless off Portsmouth. The French galleys launched an attack. But during the afternoon, the winds picked up, the breeze picked up, and the Merry Rose made its move coupled with the tides. And the result of that is in the museum. Alexis, thank you very much. Well, you might think that the uh, story of the Mary Rose, the journey is over, but it certainly isn't, as we've been hearing on this programme. There's the drying of the ship, which will go on for the next few years. There's the identifying of many more objects, which are not in this museum, but hopefully will be in this museum. And then there's the long-term project, the possibility of diving the wreck once again to bring more of the hull up and the bow section, possibly. But from us all here, a very good night. <laughs>